live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Hi, happy Science Thursday. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, by show of, no, let me do this. By clapping, let me know if you've been to the Science Cafe before. If, you, if you've been here before, fantastic. Now, all of those people, clap for all the people who haven't been here. Yes, that's my favorite way. I'm so glad that everybody is here tonight. If this is your first time to the Science Cafe, welcome. Um, every Thursday night here at the museum, here in the Daily Planet Cafe, we put on an event something like this. We've gone out into the community of science here in the Triangle and around North Carolina, sometimes even further than that, and we find interesting people doing interesting work on an incredible diversity of topics. But we go out, we find those people, bring them into the museum on a Thursday night in the cafe. You can get food and a drink from the Daily Planet Cafe, and then hear what we hope is an exciting talk about something that's going on in our world right now. So you can learn about what's going on in the world of science and research and how it applies to our daily lives. We're here every Thursday at 7 o'clock. I hope that uh, for those of you who might be new to our venue that you'll come back and uh, hear from us again, except for next week. My announcement is that next Thursday night we don't have the Science Cafe. We have another large event here happening at the museum, our adult night superhero science. If that sounds like fun to you, uh, we throw a huge party right here in the Nature Research Center, and next week's theme is all about superheroes and superheroines. So I hope that you'll come out, join us for that as well. You can check the website, naturalsciences.org, for tickets, but that also means that if you come here for a science cafe, they're going to ask for $15 at the door, so just be warned. Still give them $15, though, and, and come on in. <laughs> Do that. Uh, tonight, we have a speaker as part of our featured exhibition. So we've had a number of lectures, and we'll continue to have several speakers and lecture series coming up over the next several months, because at the museum right now, we have featured exhibition, Race, Are We So Different? Looking at the science of human variation alongside the, the lived experience and history behind race in America, and even in this exhibit, a little bit around the world. It is, I, I've been through it now several times, working for the museum. I get to go in and, and do things like that. The exhibit's free. You just get a timed ticket from the box office, so there's no barrier to entry, we hope, for anyone to be able to come in and see it. But this exhibit is, in a word, transformative. It'll change the way that you see the world around you. Um, one of the really cool things that we've been fortunate to offer as part of Race Are We So Different are these events that are called Cultural Conversations. The Cultural Conversations happen on the weekends. They're free. You just have to sign up for them, and up to 25 people can do them. You get to see the exhibit and then join with other people in your community who have also signed up for this exhibit and hear from one another. You sit in a circle, it's a safe space to express your feelings, your thoughts, what you've learned in the exhibit, and have open and honest conversations with, in many cases I've seen from these, uh, the people who sort of are also your neighbors right here in the triangle. They've been incredible opportunities to get to know the community of people around you and to see the world in a different way. Um, we're actually able to offer the cultural conversations to visitors for free because of the Duke Center for Gender, Race, Identity, and Difference, the Duke Grid Center, of which our speaker tonight, Dr. Charmaine Royal, is the founder of at Duke University. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Charmaine Royal, she's associate professor at Duke in African and African American Studies and in biology, and has another appointment with Duke Medical Center. So I think that means that she's busy. So we're very glad that we could bring her to the museum tonight uh, with help 
Please give her a warm round of applause. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Charmaine Royal. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. It is good to be here. I, good to see all of you. Thanks for coming this evening to hear about race and DNA and genetic ancestry testing. Before I even go any further, let me see the hands of those who have had, a, if you want to disclose that, those who have had a genetic ancestry test. Anybody in here? Is, ah, quite a few of you have had ancestry tests. All right, we're going to talk about ancestry testing. I'm gonna, I'm, I've structured my talk in three parts. I'm going to start by talking about race, what it is, what it's not, what genetics tells us about race. Because when we talk about ancestry testing, the issue of race often comes up. And so we're going to talk about race. And of course, the exhibit here at the museum on race, are we so different? We're going to talk about race. Then I'm going to talk about genetic ancestry testing and talk a little bit about the science behind it, how it's done, um, what geneticists are looking at, what scientists or companies are looking at when they say they're testing your DNA to look at your genetic ancestry. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the implications of genetic ancestry testing. What does it mean for individuals, for families, for society? All right? So let's start by, let me grab my clicker here so we can advance the slides. So I have three slides where I have key messages. So the key message one is the one about race, right? Then we're going to move to message two about genetic ancestry testing, how it's done, what, are, what is the science behind it, and then message three is about the implications. And I'll give you the message, and then I'll explain it. So the first slide that says, human species is not divided into biological races. Race in humans, when we talk about race, we talk about it a lot in America. It's an invention. It's made up by man. It's man-made. And when I say man-made, I mean man-made. <laughs> and so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about, about, about race. So what we know about human populations and our origins. We, looking at genetic evidence and fossil evidence, we know that all humans, modern humans, and when I say modern humans, I'm talking about humans the way we are today, the way we look today. Modern humans all originated in Africa. And I'm sorry I'm not able to do a pointer, but I'm going to try to walk you through this slide. So this slide is showing early migrations of humans. So what we know from the evidence that we've seen from fossils and genetics that modern humans originated in Eastern Africa and moved out about 100,000, 50 to 70 to 100,000 years ago, moved out of Africa to populate the rest of the world. And what you see there is a movement at different time frames to populate different parts of the world. So we have a common human origin, which says a lot about who we are as humans. We're one species. We're one species, a lot of variation. We look across this room, and we see the beauty of human diversity, a lot of variation. We're going to talk a bit about what causes that variation uh, in a minute. But we started in Africa, and we moved out and populated the rest of the world. What's happening? All right, there we go. All right, so this slide is going to show that in a much more dramatic way. So this is a slide that I got from a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins, Arvinda Chakravarti. And it's a slide that I think is just so powerful in showing us human variation and its relationship to geography. So this is a map of the world. And I'm going to click. And then as I click, you're going to look. I'm going to start out in the southernmost part of Africa. And you're going to see some faces. You're going to see people. And I want you to look and see. And we're going to talk about what happens by the time I move from southern Africa and go all the way to northern Europe. All right? I'm going to try to do this really quickly because it could take a little bit of time. What's happening with my slides, Brent? 
Am I? It's not moving. There we go. All right, all right, okay. So I'm going to keep clicking, and you keep looking at these images, all right? So we're moving. We're moving up into Asia. And look at these phenotypes. Look at the features as we move through Asia, going up to Europe. What do you see? You see a lot of variation, right? When we look at the woman at the top, the woman in, in, in Northern Europe, we look at the man down in Southern Africa, the man we started with. If we look only at those two individuals, we think that there is so much difference in human populations. There is so much difference. But if we were, and, we, and if we were to fly from the southernmost part of Africa to Europe and we see these people in Southern Africa, that woman in Europe, we say, oh, lots of difference, lots of genetic difference, right? Lots of biological difference. There's got to be race in this group. But if we were to walk from Southern Africa all the way up to Northern Europe, what we would see are incremental changes based on geography, right? We see incremental changes. The southernmost part of Africa, closer to the equator, lots of UV radiation. We need lots of melanin to be able to cope with that UV radiation. And as we move further north, we need less melanin, melanin right? And so what we are seeing is interactions between the environment and our genes. Our genes adapting to the different environments. That's what causes these differences we see. It's a combination of genes, and environment. There are genetic factors that are related to skin color, but they don't operate um, alone, by themselves. They operate in the context of an environment. So that is human variation. And the differences that we see are very small. What we say in genetics is that if you look at two individuals, if you look at that man at the bottom and the woman at the top, if you look at their DNA, you compare the DNA of these two people what we will see is that they're 99.9% .9 the same in terms of genetics. 99.9% .9 the same. 0.1% difference between any of these groups. It's a small number, 0.1%, but it's a lot in terms of genetics because there's a lot of genetic information in that 0.1% difference. And a lot of what we study when we're looking at differences in groups is that 0.1%, a lot captured in there but the fact that humans have such a small amount of, hum of variation, of genetic variation, means that we don't have race. The concept of race is a biological concept in taxonomy, in evolutionary biology, and there are certain algorithms that are used to measure race. In evolutionary biology, the concept of race is synonymous with subspecies. That's a level of divergence below the species. So you have a species, and you have some wide genetic variation, and then you have these subspecies whose genetics look very different, and that's synonymous with race in some organisms. So some evolutionary biologists will tell you that some organisms have race, because when you look at the species and you look at the divisions among those species, when you look at their genes, they are so different that they meet some of these criteria for race. When you look at humans and you look at us in terms of our variation, we do not meet those criteria. So there are not biological races in humans. So it's created. It's man-made. It exists because we created it, right? But in terms of biology, our biology says we don't have human race. So we're going to take a look at this slide. So I have two pie charts there, right? And we're seeing two people. So the one on the left, and I'm, we're gonna, here we're going to really understand what we mean by race versus ancestry, ancestry versus race. 
So we're looking at the first person there. The person has a whole lot of African ancestry. Here is ancestry. We're looking at somebody who has a lot of African ancestry and a little bit of European ancestry, right? That's ancestry. Based on how we define race and how we've constructed race in the US, how would you identify that person? In that person's ancestry, African and European. What would we call that person in terms of our race constructs in America? African-American, right? All right. The next person we see European, we see African, we see a little Native American there. That's their ancestry. What would we call that person in America? <laughs> what, what would we call this person in America based on our definition of race and African-American? The one drop rule, right? That's right, you just need one drop and you're classified as black or African-American. So you see the difference between race and ancestry? Race is created, it's constructed, right? Ancestry is what our, and, and, and you have different kinds of ancestry, but when we talk about genetic ancestry, we're looking at what the genes say about who we are. And we're gonna talk about the limitations of even those, that genetic information, right? But we're looking at ancestry and when we talk about ancestry testing, this is what people are trying to do. They're trying to get beyond these notions of I'm black, I'm white, I'm Hispa sorry. <coughs> Hispanic, I need a little water. Yeah, I'm Hispanic, you know, to see who, what, does my, what do my genes say I am, right? I mean, some people will say, who am I really? Thinking that what their genes say is, all, is, is, is who they really are, but we're gonna have that discussion about what the genes say and what does that really mean about who we are, right? So that's race and ancestry. Key message number two. Genetic ancestry testing, it's science, a lot of science there, very scientific work that's, that's done by legitimate scientists, but it's not an exact science. It's an estimation, right? Genetic ancestry testing, when you send your sample to a company and they give you some results that your you know, ancestry matches, and we talk about the different tests in a minute, to some population, some place, it's an estimation. They use statistics to calculate that, right? And I'll talk in a minute about, thank you, Katie. So, it's an estimation of an individual's genealogical history, that's your family tree, right? your family tree. It can tell you something about the people in your family. It can tell you about the approximate origins, geographic origins of your, of your ancestors. Where were they? Where, where did they come from? But we have some caveats around that information as well. And then it can tell you to which populations you might be related, right? Might be related. Again, their estimations is not an exact science, which is an important message for people to understand when they, when they do those, those tests. So let's talk a little bit about the tests that are used in genetic ancestry testing. So there are several tests. There are two broad kinds of tests, two broad classes of tests. So we have lineage testing, where you're looking at your mother's ancestry and your father's ancestry. In this slide on the left, we're looking, and the, you have three men there. On the right, you see three women. On the left, we're looking at your father's ancestry. The person at the bottom, you see they have a combination of the blue and the red there. And that person, for example, in this slide, we're saying they're looking at their father's ancestry. If we want to look just at our paternal ancestry, we look at the Y chromosome. Only men have a Y chromosome. We know that, right? So women cannot do the Y chromosome. <laughs> DNA test, but if a woman wants to find out about her father's ancestry, she could have her brother do the test. The information should be the same if they're siblings, if they have the same father, right? If we want to find out about our mother's lineage, we look at the mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is another type of DNA. When people talk about DNA very often, I think they're referring to, and, and you hear DNA all the time, most times people are re referring to what we call the nuclear DNA. But there are different types of DNA. There's a nuclear DNA, the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we have. But there's another DNA called mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria 
are some organelles in the cell that are the energy producing um, uh, organelles in the cell, right? And they have their own mitochondria. And mitochondrial DNA is passed unchanged from mother to all of her children. You see mother passes it to her sons and her daughters, but only the daughters pass on mitochondrial DNA, right? Sons do not typically pass on mitochondrial DNA. So you can use mitochondrial DNA, we use it in, in science, to tell about your mother's 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 mother, Y chromosome to tell about your father's 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 father, okay? That's the lineage test. The other broad type of test that's used is what's called the admixture test or the biogeographical test. And I have here admixture, the concept. For this test, they're not looking at the mitochondrial DNA, they're not looking at the Y, they're looking at these other chromosomes that we call autosomes, and that's the one to 22, right? And they're looking at all of those chromosomes for both your mom and your dad to look at how mixed you are in terms of certain geographic populations. So when I say this is a concept, this is a slide that I got from one of my colleagues, and I use it with a lot of caveats, right? So admixture is a concept. The idea of admixture is that, that all of us are mixed with a number of different groups. So some of us have European ancestry and Native American, and this slide kind of shows how that comes about. But the idea of admixture, the general idea, is that at some point in time, there were these populations that never really mixed, and then over time, they started mixing. So you'll see I have there two African chromosomes, and I have African in quotes, because there are no such thing as African chromosomes, right? There are no such thing as African chromosomes, but this pretty much gives the message I'm, I'm trying to communicate. So these are chromosomes that come from particular populations in Africa. Two European chromosomes coming from people in Europe way back when, before a whole lot of mixing was going on, but they were always, we were always mixed, right? And so we're showing them here as almost pure populations, but we don't have pure populations. But this is just showing what people are looking at when they do the admixture test. So over time and over generations, when people mate and there's mixing, we have movements and mixtures and breakings of chromosomes and they combine and recombine in various ways. And so over time, eventually you see the person at the end, they'll end up with a combination of different proportions of the chromosome from these different populations. When you do the admixture test, or sometimes it's called the biogeographical ancestry test. Sometimes it's called the autosomal test. It's looking at all of your genes, all of your DNA, outside of those y and the Y and chromosome that you inherit from both your mother and your father. And typically those tests will tell you something like, you're 20% Sub-Saharan African, you're 50% Native American. Companies like 23andMe, which is one of the companies does something that's called ancestry painting, and they can give you a range of populations, not just the continental populations, but give you regions. So companies can give you a range of different types of information about regions where people um, are from, depending on their, their database. Then the next message is that the benefits and harms of genetic ancestry testing depend on a lot of things, depend on many things in terms of the person, him or herself, who isn't doing the test of the experiences that people have had. In studies that we have done, we have found that people's responses to their tests are invariably related to what they bring to the testing, the experiences they have, their own conceptions of their identity coming in, their family stories uh, that have circulated in their families about who they are and who they're related to, the communities within which they live, and then of course society's perspective about who is who and who is not, right? And in thinking about the harms and benefits of genetic ancestry testing, I'm gonna, this slide has a lot of things in it, and I, we've titled it there, Interest in Genetic Ancestry Testing. So you see, it's, it's hard to see some of these things, but on, on the left side, we show some of those videos um, like African American lives, I'm sure some people have seen that by Skip Gates where people get their ancestry test and they are shocked about what they found and who they are related to or who they're not related to and they start crying because they didn't get what they thought they wanted to get. And so, <laughs> 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 
And so we've all seen those videos and those stories. We've seen Oprah who thought she was Zulu and related to the Zulu and found out, no, she's not Zulu. And so they, all these things, we've seen them. We've seen celebrities do these things. But ordinary people like you and uh, have, have done these tests. So, so, so people have told their stories based on their, on their tests. We also, I ha also have on that slide the logos from some of the ancestry testing companies. So this area, this field of genetic ancestry testing started in about 2000 when Family Tree DNA was the first company and their logo is there, Family Tree DNA based in Houston. And that was the first company in 2000 that started genetic ancestry testing. And since then, a lot of companies have, have grown and developed and, and some have closed and been bought by others. In a paper in 2012 that one of my postdocs and I did a survey of these companies, we published a paper that at that time there were about 40 c companies. Um, since then, there, the, like a couple years later, there are about 35. Last I looked, there were probably about 70, right? And it doesn't just mean that there's just a growth in these companies. Again, as I said, some companies have folded, some have merged, new companies have come up. So these companies, and some of the, and these companies do different things. So companies like 23andMe, some of you may have done your tests with 23andMe, they do both ancestry testing and health-related testing. They also test for traits and everything else, right? Companies like Ancestry.com focuses primarily on genetic ancestry. African Ancestry, a company that I'm very familiar with, it's run by a, a friend of colleague of mine, focuses on African ancestry. So the companies do different things, they offer different things, and so people have to kind of know what they're looking for to determine which company to go to. And I think many consumers are not really aware of some of those differences. So people have become very interested in the science of genetic ancestry testing and what they feel it can do um, for, for them. When I talk about, I haven't really got into talking about the benefits and I'm gonna stop soon so we can have discussion. Because the, I, the slide before, I, I talked about the benefits and harms and there's a lot of discussion in the academic world about the potential harms and the potential benefits. Lots of people have had these tests who have had good experiences. They found information that corroborated their family stories and they're very, very happy to, to see that. And then we have people who got information that did not and they were disappointed. There are some people for whom the science means a lot more than some other people. So for some people, they came into this testing with a story about who they were and who they're related to. And the test gives, so for example, th in, some of our, in one of our studies or some of our studies, we'll have people who come in thinking they have Native American ancestry. Some actually come in looking for the Native American ancestry, right? Wanting to find some, oh, my grandmother, she had long hair all the way down to the ground. She, we have to have some Native American ancestry, right? Uh, as Oprah says, everybody want to be Indian. We got some Indian, everybody got some Indian. And so this whole thing about who we are and the stories that have circulated in our family, people come with these stories. And for some people, they'll get, the, for the, if they're admixture test, they'll get 0% Native American ancestry. And I see different responses to that 0%. For some people, they'll get 0% and they'll say, oh, the test says 0%, so I guess our stories were wrong. I guess we don't have any Native American ancestry, right? Then there are those people who will say, 0%? Oh no, <laughs> I, I don't trust that test. We've got Native American ancestry. That test is wrong. And some of those people will go to another company, right? To go to another company to try to get the information that they want. The truth is that depending on which company you go to, you could get different information. They could get a result that says they have Native American ancestry. Why is that? Because these companies, they are different in different ways. So there are certain things that determine how accurate, and I use that term very carefully, how accurate a test might be. One of them is what we know about human variation. What we know about hu how human populations are divided and substructured and related to each other. We know a lot, but there's a lot that we still don't know. So our knowledge about human variation is very limited. And that is influences how we interpret and how we understand this information. Another thing that determines what results you get 
are the databases that these companies have, right? So when you send a swab, these companies will tell you to use a cheek swab, swab your cheek, send it off to us. They're comparing your DNA with DNA that they have in a database, right? Those databases that companies use, some of them are public access databases that are used not just by companies, they're used by researchers. So these technologies, the tests that I showed you, the lineage tests, the admixture tests, those technologies were developed in academia. They were not developed in, in industry. They were developed in academia. And many of the people who run these companies are academicians, still are. Some of them were, some of them are not. But lot, a lot of this came from academia. And these are the same tools that popular lineage test, the admixture, admixture test, well, the technology, not the test. The testing is done by the companies. But research using lineage, lineage um, looking at lineages, research looking at admixture, looking at biogeographical ancestry, those technologies are used by researchers. They're used by population geneticists who study populations to try to find out how populations are related to each other, right? But the ancestry testing companies are looking at individuals, and that is where we run into a lot of the problems because it's harder to tell you that you are related to this person here versus telling a population that you may be related to a group over there. And the databases that the companies use determine what results you get. Some companies have really large databases. They have the public access databases, but they also have data from populations all over the world. The African Ancestry, African Ancestry, the company that I'm very, a company I'm very familiar with, the largest African database, lin, li, number of lineages in, in terms of Africa, sampled all over Africa in terms of getting information on African populations. They're able to tell you a lot more than some companies that would not have that amount of information, right? So the database is critical. We also know, as I said before, that the information we get are estimates. So there's statistics that they use. So when they look at your DNA, they look at the DNA in the database. What you get as your result is a probability that, okay, your DNA matches more closely to the, the Yoruba people in Nigeria than it does to the Akan people in Ghana. So they give you the Akan information. You don't get the European, the Yor Yoruba information. That is also a match but not as high in terms of the statistics. So it's a statistic, statistical exercise, and the statistics that are used determine what results you get, right? And the last thing that determines the results are the markers themselves. I talked about lineage testing. A marker is a piece of DNA with a known location on a chromosome. So we use these markers to tell you information about where you might, who you might be related to, because there are parts of the genome and I showed it in the slides in terms of geography, there are parts of the genome that are more common in some populations than others. We know that. There are parts of the genome. That's human variation. But there are no parts of the genome or, or not very a lot of the genome that's found only in one population and not others. So it's a matter of frequency. So that information also factors into that. So the responses and the information that people get have to be couched in terms of these factors. People have to understand that information in light of what we know about the limitations of what these tests can tell us. And for some people, it's a positive thing. For others, it's not. And a lot of it depends on what people bring to this. I lost my last slide there. I, I put this here because in talking about genetic ancestry testing, the exhibit is on race. It talks about the science of race, the history of race, and the lived experience of race. And for those of you who have not, let me see the hands of those who have seen the exhibit already. All right, wonderful, a number of you have seen it. For those who have seen it, it might be good to go through it again with this knowledge that you have in terms of what genes tell us or not about populations and even this whole idea of ancestor testing. For those of you who have not gone, you definitely need to go uh, and see it because what I talked about is just a snippet of the information that you would get from that exhibit, dispelling this notion of race, right? Looking and understanding the limitations of what genetics can tell you. The genetics tell you some information, but it's not the whole story, right? We can say our, your genes trace to this part of Africa or this part of Europe, or your gene matches the, the genes of the, or your genetic information matches the genetic information of the people over there, but we will need more information to be able to tell you 
whether your ancestors came from that place. We'll need some historians in the picture. We'll need some anthropologists to help us understand the context. So genes don't operate out by themselves. They are always operating in a context. And we need to bring the context in to help us understand the information. All right? I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Fantastic. I am going to publicly make one correction. When I identified the name of your center at Duke University, I said gender. It is gender. genomics, <laughs> race, identity, Thank you, and Chris. difference. <laughs> I genomics. was corrected. Thank you. This is the Q&A part of the night. I have a microphone. Katie back here has a microphone. If you have questions, raise your hands. We'll bring you a microphone. That way everyone in the theater can hear. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have. So I'm going to start right here, since I have the camera. Hey, Dr. Royals, um, thanks for taking us through that. I guess my question is, because of my concerns always are about the quality control around this relative, specifically to the databases. And you have those insights. But is there a place where we, as the public who want to engage these tests, can access and get a better understanding of the various databases that are used uh, by these companies, if not by the researchers? And when you say ax to access them, what do you mean? Wh where we can clearly, not because we want to use them, but mm -hmm. maybe we do want to better understand what they consist of mm -hmm. in a manner that helps us better understand uh, what we're trying to find out and whether or not that or those databases can give us uh, the insights that right. we're seeking. And I, I'm a big stickler on the fact that Yes, this is a statistical game and it's fun, and we shouldn't take it too seriously, at least. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> All right, so the database, so some of the databases that these companies use are public databases. Again, like I said before, these technologies originated in academia, and researchers at universities have databases with populations that they use for studies in population genetics, um, epidemiology, a lot of databases are used that researchers have access to. Some of those databases may be available to the public, but, th but there's a, there's limit, there are limitations in terms of, of the access to those databases. So those are the public access databases, right? In addition to these databases that... Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. In addition to those public databases, that all researchers pretty much have access to and they can use in their companies, they can use it in their research. The companies also have proprietary databases and that's where the problem lies. I shouldn't say the problem lies because it's not, you know, I'm not saying the companies are a problem, but the thing about proprietary databases is that nobody, not even other researchers, can access those databases. And that is one of the things that myself and others that I work with as well as the companies. When we've been engaging a group of, of companies, the CEOs of some of these companies that I have here, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and others, in talking about guidelines for genetic ancestry testing. And a big part of those guidelines is what's in those databases and how can we check. How, how, can, I s how can we know that what this company over here is calling Yoruba is what this company over here is calling Yoruba? We don't know that. And right now, we don't have any way of knowing that. Because they're proprietary database. These are companies, right? Companies for profit. Some of these companies, though, recognize the problem with that, is that we need to have some checks and balances, right? We need to be able to say that, OK, we know that we're all looking at the same thing and calling the same thing what it is, right? Um, but the challenges of owning databases and having proprietary information as a company, is, uh, it's, it's hard to navigate that. And so we've been in, an, in discussion and, and I think we're getting to a point where 
there may be some solution inside in terms of the companies kind of coming together to figure out the best ways to do that kind of, of quality control um, among themselves. And, and they're talking along with bioethicists and other geneticists about what are the ways to do it. But it's not gonna be easy in terms of saying, we just want access to your database. It is not gonna happen that way because they're proprietary, right? And of course, if you give away all your information, then people are gonna go to that other company. They're not gonna come to you, right? So some companies want to retain some of what they have as quote unquote unique to that company. I mean, there's not a lot that's unique, but some companies have much larger databases, much more expansive databases than others, right? The types of markers in terms of the lineage testing and the admixture map testing, the types of markers and the numbers of markers make a difference in terms of how you, the kind of information that you can give, right? So the companies some want to hold on to that kind of information. So I'm back to the beginning of your wonderful talk okay. um, and the very valuable um, statement that um, race as a concept is created by man, not um, genetics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment and elaborate on what I understand to be that um, human creation, the story of that creation of the concept of race, that this is a concept that arose in, uh, or at least was, uh, became popular um, in the context of European imperialism and colonialism, and that it wasn't just a concept about difference, but it was a concept about of superiority. Okay. Um, so th that's about all I know. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, whether your scholarly understanding corresponds to that. And secondly, whether um, the historical record supports it in, in your understanding. So for example, did the concept of race um, come into vogue along with is the time right along with imperialism and colonialism or did it come before? Um, and also, was the concept of race um, uh, created and spread by Europeans or did it exist in some of the populations that um, were subjugated um, in the course of imperialism and colonialism? But if you can comment on this historical understanding, that would be great. All right, so, you're, so you're, you're absolutely right. The concept of race came in the way back in the, in the 18th century and, and before, in the Enlightenment period. And we had people like Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus, taxonomist, and blooming back who created these classifications of human groups. And, and a lot of those classifications we still use now, particularly Blumenbach, where we, the classifications, Linnaeus was, Carlos Linnaeus was a taxonomist, right? And he named a lot of the organisms that we know, and he gave names to, to human groups, primarily based on geography. His student, Blumenbach, Johann Blumenbach, came after and built on what he did. But he didn't just use geography, he used some, um, subjective measures of beauty, right? And that's where the ranking came in, in terms of looking at the skulls of Europeans and saying they're the most beautiful, beautiful people. And people from the Caucasus Mountains is where we get Caucasians from, right? Which is a problematic term in and of itself. But the beauty that, that, that he saw. And so uh, when we think about race and those kinds of constructs, those, th the question, the, the question you ask about whether the concept of race in terms of humans came about before enslavement and colonialism or after is a, is a, is a, con is a continued debated question among historians. There are some that feel that African peoples were thought of as inferior and that's why they were enslaved. And we know other people were enslaved as well, right? But then there are those who feel that no, it's the, ens the enslavement of Africans was a purely economic enterprise, and it was as a result of that, that, and it was during that period that the concept of race came about. And we, we also know that Thomas Jefferson, 
one of our presidents, was one of those who put forward the idea of blacks as being inferior in his notes on the state of Virginia that he wrote, where he talked about um, blacks being an inferior race. It's likely that they are. And he was one of the first prominent Americans to call on science to prove that. When if you, I don't know if any of you in here have read this notes on the state of Virginia, but it's inter an interesting read from one of our presidents about his perceptions of, 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 of the Negro then. Um, and so that idea came about and it just pervaded all of, of, of our society. So, that, so you're absolutely right. That's when it, it, the, the idea, it's the, our idea came about a long time ago, but in terms of America, a lot of it ca came in terms of uh, around the time of, 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 of enslavement of, 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 of African peoples. But again, like I said, people were thought of as being inferior, so others could have been led to believe to be superior, right? And, and that's really what race is about, is subjugating, is classifying people as inferior and superior to give power to those who deem themselves as superior. Yeah. So show of hands if you have questions real quick, that way I know who to bring microphones to. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, one was there's been some recent evidence that there was a uh, interbreeding between Neanderthals and quote modern unquote humans. Mm -hmm. Is there any current DNA that shows any of that left, or is it just totally faded out by now? And the second one was how come it took forty thousand years to get to let's say central France and, me and on, on, on your map, and then there's also 40,000 there over in, in Australia, which is way further away. Well, it, it, the migrations, well, I don't know why it took so long for those, for those, for those, those, those populations to, to, my, to migrate. Um, I mean, they started at the closer to, you know, Europe and Asia, and then, and then moved further out. The whole issue of Neanderthal, yes, we still, and people, who do some DNA testing and some companies will give you the percentage of Neanderthal DNA. And it's believed that humans, after moving out of Africa, mated with Neanderthals in, in Europe. So when we, for so many people with African, more recent African descent, will not have Neanderthal DNA because the mating happened after that time period. But there are some people, some African Americans I know, who have done ancestry testing and have found the amount of, of Neanderthal. And usually we'll find about 4% max in terms of the amount of Neanderthal DNA. But, but some people have found their Neanderthal. I'll let Chris. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. I really appreciate it. I want to go back to the gentleman's question about whether race is uh, uh, an artifact of uh, uh, colonialism and so on. And I wonder if it's accurate to say that it is that, because if we go back to, let's just say, subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, uh, Hinduism was there around 1000 BC, in that, I a different version of that racism was caste system, mm -hmm. which is still prevalent. Right. So I wonder if it's accurate to say that, or it's just uh, a justification or a rationalization. And that's a very good question. So I was responding specifically to the concept of race. But the idea of inferiority and superiority is, is a human idea. And it, and it goes way back in time. So even now, we talk about race in America. I mean, I just came back from South Africa and work a lot with people in different parts of Africa. Outside of South Af Africa, many countries in Africa don't talk about race, but they talk about tribes and ethnicity and the same kinds of ideas about inferiority and superiority exist. So whether we, and, and my center grid, race is in the, in the title of the center, but we look at all of these kinds of identities that are tied to ancestry. And the caste, caste is, is, is one of them. It's the same idea of people subjugating others to elevate themselves. And that's, we find that globally, whether we call it race or something else. And, and one of the things that interests me is to look globally at what the conceptions are based on these same ideas 
and, and how we as humans are similar in that way in terms of always wanting to be on top and, and having to find somebody to subjugate. Good evening. Good um, evening. My question is this. I, I, I had a 23andMe test done about a year ago. And among other things, it, conclude, it included that I had a 4% chance of having the hair color that I actually have. Mm -hmm. You have what, what chance? 4% <laughs> that I have my hair color. All right. Was, there we go. You wonder why they even put that in there. But <laughs> it made me really question just how seriously should I take this information. And also, I'm curious as how they came up with that number. Do you have any comment <laughs> on either of that? I'd like to know the same thing myself. <laughs> so, so 23andMe is one of the bigger companies. Again, they do a lot of ancestry stuff, but they also do, do health-related testing and trait testing. And they look at everything from hair color, eye color, uh, your, your ability to produce air wax. I mean, they look, if you go on, everything is there. Everything is there. And, and those of us in genetics are, are always cautioning people, particularly when you start looking at traits. I mean, diseases are one thing, and diseases themselves are complex in, in terms of, of, of their origin. But when you're looking at things like hair color, eye color, skin color, the complexity of the genes and the environment that go into creating those, it, it, it is virtually almost impossible to predict. I mean, you can, you can come pretty close, right? But the, the information that they use, the algorithms that they use for, to come up with those numbers will always be flawed. Because again, like I said, we only know so much about human genetic variation. And these traits are super duper complex. They are multiple genes, multiple environmental factors that go into making them. Now, there are times that these companies will give you accurate information. I mean, for other people, they could go on and get the exact hair color, the exact I color, and, and that's because, as I said before, the information, we have to take it with a grain of salt. It's, not, it's genetics, it's science, there is something to it, because science tells us something about all of who we are, right? Our bodies started with DNA, so there's something there. The question is, how do we interpret what we find? So sometimes, just like with ancestry testing, many people in the studies that we have done, many, and I dare say probably most of the people, who came into those tests with preconceived notions about who they are and who they're related to, many of them, the tests corroborate their stories, at least to some degree. Maybe not the whole story, but there is something. So there is something there, and we know that. We always, though, have to have some caveats around it because there are limitations to what we can, we can know. Sometimes we'll be correct, and sometimes we'll be totally off. Uh, very recently, there was a discovery in, I believe, Tunisia in North Africa mm -hmm. of a cave that had a population of modern humans. Mm -hmm. And the date is somewhere between uh, 280 and 300 million years ago, or mm -hmm. a, a thousand years ago, sorry. So how does that affect our understanding of human origins, in particular of the origins of modern humans? That's a good question, because there, there, uh, there was another find a few years ago um, that was very similar in, in terms of time frame. And geneticists and anthropologists are constant. I mean, we, we know that humans originated at a, way back in time, and that we've moved and, and, and populated the world at different times. But that information is constant, constantly being revised and rewritten as we learn more. And the fact that we have technology now, we can sequence genomes now, right? We can sequence whole genomes. We can also sequence, meaning looking at all of the little bits and pieces, the three billion bases that make up DNA. We can look at modern humans and current people living today, but we have the technology now, is, is it, it's becoming so much more sophisticated for us to be able to interpret that data. But those data will, like everything else that we find, be incorporated in the story. And over time, the story gets revi revised and rewritten. Because what we know now about human populations and how we came to be in terms of variation, we didn't know that um, some years ago. So ti with, with time, we, we en enhance the story, we correct the story, 
Um, and that will be one of those things that will get written in um, as we learn more. Yeah. Thank you for the, this talk. Um, this is another question about the, what the state of the art is. Do you, this, there's so much information here, and as you've been pointing out, some of it is reliable, some of it's not. Some of there's there's a lot of fuzz around the edges, but this sort of screams to me to be a a uh, task that would be appropriate for study by neural networks. Do you know if anybody's doing that? I don't know neural networks. You, you said uh, neural networks basically to, to oversimplify, they're basically learning systems that can take huge amounts of data and discover patterns within them, and it's mostly used for cause and effect kinds of, of things, you, and predictability, to verify predictability. I'm not sure if people are using neural, neural networks per se, but I know that the now there's a lot of push to look at integrative um, science and integrative biology, and looking at systems as opposed to just looking at genes by themselves. And so I imagine that eventually those kinds of, 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 of resources will come into play. But geneticists are now teaming up with other scientists um, to start looking at genes and genetics in a broader context and making those connections with other types of sciences, but also other types of basic sciences, but also connections with the social and behavioral sciences, which I think is so critical. It might be an interesting uh, project for, for some grad students to yes. create a neural network analysis of, of the available databases. That's right. That would be interesting. <laughs> Any graduate student in here want to take that up? <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Um, so I didn't, I don't know if my question is necessarily appropriate for your um, academic background just because it tends to be more of from a social point of view because I don't have the science background. That's um, all right. I do the social too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I didn't have a concept of race until I got to school because mm -hmm. you know, I, I've always identified as mixed because I didn't know what else to say to appropriately associate all of my parents and, mm -hmm. and relatives and everything like that. So of course when you get into school and you got the little kids they're not exactly known for tact so you get the what are you questions type of thing. I didn't know the answers, so I said American and thought I was going to get a star and it didn't happen. <laughs> um, so I get my question is, I know that at the beginning of your talk you were kind of breaking down what race is in, in like um, considered in other species and kind of wanted an example of that because, you know, from there for me it's been particularly confusing because of relationships that I've had that have been good, some of them not so good, um, and it's hard to try and define for me, like I would always ask my friends difference between race and ethnicity because you know, then I was, I was trying to find a way to ask the question appropriately where someone won't look at you like you've got three eyes <laughs> and you're like, I really just kind of want to know what your heritage is because I can tell from the way that we're speaking and the culture that you're referring to that it's so much more different than mine and I would like to know more information about it. Um, so I would ask questions like that and either get appreciative responses or not so much. So it was more of like, I just kind of wanted an example of what the difference was when you were talking about for other species where it's like, because their genetics are so different, this is considered a sub-racial, I'm not sure if that's the right term, subspecies. Um, so I just kind of wanted an example to try and help myself out. <laughs> so there, there are a number of different, and I'm going to try to keep this really short, there are a number of different algorithms that are used to measure genetic variation, which is what we're talking about with subspecies, and it's what we're talking about when the concept of race as a biological concept, right? And one of those algorithms is called, is called Wright's FST. It's an algorithm that gives you a threshold of 0.25, and that's a thre threshold below which if, if, you're, if the v amount of variation is 0.25, it's, it's complicated, but if the amount of variation is 0.25 or greater, if it's that much variation when you look at two organisms within a species, then we can say that organism has race. So there are some organisms like gray wolves, some species of gray wolves that 
according to those criteria, have, I have a slide, I didn't bring it here, that looks at humans in relation to some other organisms that could be said to have race, right? They're above the 0.25 threshold. When you look across human, the human genome, our rights FST, or, fixa or it's called fixation index, is 0.156. We're well below that 0.25 threshold, right? That's one measure of uh, that's, that's often used, and it's, continue, it's still used by many geneticists to look at population substructure, they call it, or genetic variation. So in a, it, organisms that have above that are, tend to be the classified as having race, and those that have below. And humans are one of the least uh, diverse in terms of variation organisms. And part of that is that humans are, ha have not been around as long as some other organisms to develop the amount of variation that other organisms has done. So over time, many organisms have been able to develop that. Uh, so the question that some people will ask, well, if we're around for another million years, could we say we have race? Well, many geneticists and evolutionary biologists think we won't, be we won't do that because humans move and migrate. Other organisms tend to stay in different habitats. So the likelihood of them mixing and mingling are, are less than humans. With travel, we're, we're constantly traveling, so we're always mixing. So the isolation that you need to develop that level of divergence, we will never achieve it is what many how many geneticists feel, right? Um, I had a question, but a little background information. Um, so I'm in a dentist chair, and the dentist is in, all in my mouth. And she says, oh, you have shovel teeth. You know, that's very common for you Asians. And I'm like, I'm not Asian. <laughs> okay, I've gotten that my whole life. Um, and so fast forward, my father, his teeth and my uncle's teeth, they don't get numb. The, the wiring's in the wrong place. And that's only known in either redheads, which is not known to my patrilineal side, and then also in Native Americans. Back to the suspecting Native American. I've had my DNA tested by Ancestry.com, and I got Zippo, all European, um, well, maybe Northern Africa, but not that was very, like, minor compared to, uh, you know, the other ethnicities that they pointed out. And so I'm wondering if one suspects one is Native American, is there a better test? Is there my grandmother's, on my dad's side, my grandmother's father was adopted. She's very dark. She has three grades of hair on her head. Um, we suspect something's up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Greek something, we don't know. <laughs> but I'm the only one in that family that's been tested. Who would you recommend get tested? Like my father or my brother could do it? Or, um, and who's got a good database for Native Americans? That's a very good question. So if, so you've been tested, none of your male relatives have been tested? N none of them, no. No. Okay. None of the males. All right. So the, having one of them tested could probably tell you something, because there could be something in your patrilineal line, right? Um, the thing about Native American ancestry is that it's hard. One, the data, there are not many databases that have Native American genetic information, right? Because many Native American populations are, are reluctant to participate in genetic studies, reluctant to give up their DNA, right? Um, not all, but some. So there is a dearth of information about Native American ancestry. We often will find Native American ancestry, we will be able, that you can often find Native American ancestry or genetic information in the admixture test. So people, companies are often able to tell you you have this amount of native, you know, 5%, 2% to some degree, but they usually cannot tell you the tribe. There, there's pretty much no company now, unless one popped up last night, that can tell you <laughs> which Native American tribe you belong to. But some of them will give you information about your Native American ancestry as a whole in terms of the geographic. Um, they, they, All right, well, maybe she is then. <laughs> maybe you do have that ancestry. <laughs> All right. 
Okay. So I hope I have one really short answer and a second follow-up. So since you're saying there's really not regulation of these companies, I would hope that the academias would be taking one person's and sampling them four times and sending them off to the different companies and getting results back. So is there any information on what percent of variability on the same person? Because just like when you get your blood tested, mm -hmm. there's differences in labs mm -hmm. on what the number comes out to be. So is there any information on, okay, here's the percent of variability if you want to blow your money on checking this, even though it's unregulated. My right. second follow-up question is an environmental question because while I understand the scientific concept of it's protective to have more melanin the closer you are to the equator, <coughs> um, I also for health reasons read a book about eating for your blood type. And his philosophy was if you came from a certain area, Africa versus Europe, basically the environment was the hugest factor in determining your blood type. So if you were in this population that only ate grains all the time, um, your blood type is blah, because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> to me, all of that sounds great, and his medical practice, he helped his patients a lot by giving them a diet based on what their blood test was, but if you're an O blood type that's a meat eater, and you suddenly decide, okay, I'm only going to be a vegetarian and I'm going to eat that, why doesn't your blood type change? So if you were from a population that was born close to the equator and you have a lot of melanin versus somebody that's further away that doesn't, if that person moves down to the equator and stays there for years, does their melanin not change? So I'm, I'm asking what percent really does the environment have because obviously it has, it to me, why wouldn't your blood type morph if you totally changed your diet based on that gentleman's thought process? Okay. So these changes that we're talking about in terms of skin color o happen over lots of lots of years. So we'd ha they'd have to be there for it to change. But we change daily, right? Our, our bodies change, they adapt to different things. So adaptation, change is happening even as we're sitting here, it's happening. Some, some changes occur a lot faster than others. And so uh, the, the role of the environment is complicated and I think we're just beginning to, to, to really, I wouldn't even say to understand it, to really begin to start teasing out the environment. And, and, for, and especially with genetics now, I think what, one, when the Human Genome Project started in 1990, there was this thinking that, oh, genetics is just gonna revolutionize everything. And what many geneticists are finding is that the big impacts that they thought genes would have on disease outcomes and the big findings, we've got some, gotten some big findings, but they're not as predictive of the outcome as they thought, recognizing that the environment, and when I say environment, I'm not just talking about what you eat or what you're exposed to physically, I'm also talking about the social environment. The social environment that influences your psyche, it influences your behavior, it influences your lifestyle, influences where you live, all of those things play into who we are, the diseases that we're exposed to, the mental health conditions that we get. And so the environment is complicated both from a historic and evolutionary perspective but <laughs> probably even more so from a contemporary uh, perspective. So there, there are people that have done that. I can't tell you, and I don't know if any papers have been published. I know people who have, and some of my grad students have. I mean, we published a paper on looking at sports-related testing, where I have a, had one of my postdocs, she sent her sample to different sports companies and got different results and we have a paper on that. But other people have looked at, have sent samples to different companies. I am not sure what the percentage is, but that is a way um, of looking at, at the companies and seeing, 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 seeing what, what happens with the samples. I think um, the, the process of, of, of trying to do this kind of quality control is it's, it's a long process and it's, it's gonna take time for us to really 
see what the best way is to, to, to accomplish that. Um, but that's something that people have done. Whether they've written it up, I can't, I can't tell. But the bottom line is that they found differences, right? <laughs> you find differences, and again, I told you why we find differences. So, all right. Chris? Yeah, I have a question about the, what you were saying about the sort of constructed nature of race, and, and mm -hmm. I definitely think that makes sense. But I was thinking about, I took a class recently about literary theory, and we talked about Derrida, and he would talk about how defining something, you know, often means that you're defining other things as being, um, as being sort of inferior to that thing. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering sort of in that connection, is, is there a way that if race, and it, I, I'm sure it is, is, an, is a imprecise way to talk about these things from a scientific point of view, these differences in the human species, is there a scientific way of thinking about those differences that's more specific? And then is there a way that we can translate that into the social sphere and the way that we talk about race socially? So we call that genetic variation, right? And we, we actually talk about it as human variation, what we see. But it's not just genetics. We have differences in culture. We have differences. All the differences that we have is all part of human variation. So we tend to say what we're seeing as difference is not race. It's a reflection of human, human variation. One of the, the big areas where this becomes complex and becomes even more critical is in healthcare, right? And I, I teach a course at Duke, teach medical students, I taught them today, have a course race in medicine. And, and many of the medical, they've learned for the whole year, me here heard me talking about ra race is not a biological construct. It's, it's a social, and I won't say it's a social construct, uh, but it's, 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 it is a social construct, but I won't just say that and leave it there. It's a social construct with biological implications, right? We've made it up, but it has biological implications on the groups that have been raced and those that have that created it too, actually. Um, so the bio biology is intertwined. And when we look at the differences, the question is whether those differences are natural and innate from way back when, or whether the differences in health outcomes that we're seeing, for example, came about later as a result of the creation of these, of the, of these, of these categories and the way we treat the people that we've, that, that, that we've raised. So I think the way we talk about it depends on what we're doing and, and the questions that we are asking. So it's not, it's not I don't think it's, it's appropriate necessarily to just move from race and say ethnicity because the ethnicity is, is something else, right? And we, in a study that we just did of the US population, we asked people what's race, what's ethnicity, ethnicity what's ancestry, and the variation that we got. Many people could not tell us what ethnicity is. They, they had no, they're like, I don't know. They could give you an answer for race, but ethnicity, people are all, when, and worse, when we ask them their ethnicity, <laughs> oh, I don't have an ethnicity. You know, they, they, they just don't know. So the, so the concepts and the terms that we use are, are determined by the questions that we are asking. Um, but in, ger in general, I, we're looking at genetic variation or human variation more broadly, as opposed to race, right? Here we go. Hi. Um, so I came here, I have all kinds of thoughts and feelings. I came here with the idea, 70% sure that I might want to do a DNA test because I think it would be fun. Now I'm thinking, what, does it even matter to me? Do I even care? <laughs> um, I didn't mean to do that to no. my friends who own the companies. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good because I think, um, like a lot of other people, I am curious about, is there a website that will tell, I had no idea that there were so many different testings. Mm -hmm. Is there a website that will tell the pros and cons or a comparison of all of the different sites? The other thing is, so, um, I, I wanted to do the testing, I have four sisters, and I thought, oh, we can all go in and just do one testing. Then I realized, no, my results may be different, even from my sister, who my twin sister, who's fraternal, of That's course, right. and then from my daughter. I'm glad to know you understand that, because yes. many people don't. They think yes. because we're sisters, we're supposed to, and I get calls from people, my sister and I did the test, and they got X, Y, Z, and I got A, B, C. Yeah. Why? Why is that? Is the test wrong? No, you inherited different parts of the genome yes. from your parents, right? Which further complicated things. <laughs> and then my daughter, of course, would be not totally different, but still different from myself. That's right. Is there one test that is better for predicting a larger pool so that, I don't know. 
<laughs> ah, dear. Okay. So, I mean, I would, uh, no, I, I would say it, it really depends on what you're looking for. The companies, so you have some companies. There's a company called Genographics, Genographic. Um, it, is, it comes out of the, G the National Geographic and IBM. It's a combination of, it's called the Genographic Project. It's really a research project. That project looks at what we call deep ancestry. So it takes you way back to mitochondrial Eve. It can take you back there. And I have people who go to that company because their test is $99. It was one of the cheapest. I think others are 99 now. And they go to that thinking, oh, they're going to be able to tell me which tribe in Africa I'm related to. That test doesn't tell you that, right? It t tells you how close you are to mitochondrial Eve. And so the people who will do that test, they'll come, I did that test and that's not what I want. Which company do I go to? to? So you really have to do your homework. There's, a, there's an organization called the International Society of Genetic Genealogists, the ISOG, right? And it's on their website, they do some of that in terms of, of helping cons consumers understand the test. But they're a group of us, geneticists and bioethicists and, and the companies, they're that same group of about 60 that, that we're engaging in in conversations. That's one of the things that we're talking about, about doing um, uh, to make some resource available to people so they can understand. I mean, not it, it, it will be hard to say. I mean, there are people who come to me and I re recommend certain companies over others based on what the person is looking for. Because um, some companies do a better job of communicating the information, of, of, of interpreting the information to consumers than others. But there's no one. Sorry, not yet. <laughs> Let's give her another round of applause. Fantastic. Thank you, very much. Thank you for being here. Thank sharing you your for insights. Having me. It was good to be here. Yeah. Good to have all of you. My gosh, look at how many people came. Yeah, we had a lot of people. This is exciting. Thank you to all of you for coming out to the Science Cafe tonight. Uh, I hope that before you leave, do, do me a favor, fill out the feedback forms that are on the tables. Uh, stay in touch with us. Leave your contact email address there. We want to let you know about more exciting events that are happening here at the Museum of Natural Sciences all the time. And do, if you have not or if you have already, come back. Come and see Race, Are We So Different? The ticket is free. We can't make it much better than that. So come and see the exhibit. We hope to see you again here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Except don't come back next Thursday night unless you want to pay $15 and join the coolest science party in North Carolina. <laughs> Have right. a great night, everybody. Thank you all. <laughs>